Hi everyone. On this segment of The Family Table, we're going to do something a little unique. We are going to extract honey from my and my husband's hives. We have beehives, it was a hobby, and then we started just really looking into it. And um, we decided that this is fun. It's not only helpful or even healthy for us because the honey we know is very good for you, but it turned out to be a lot of fun. So we're very happy that we did get our, our hives. We're gonna show you what it takes to extract honey from a beehive and get that liquid gold. So let me introduce to you. This is my husband, Ken. He started it all. He wanted bees and now we have a couple of hives. This is Kyle. He's an apiarist. So that means he has an apiary which is, has beehives and that's what he does. He is now teaching my husband to be a beekeeper. And of course I'm thrown in the mix anyways. But my job is to take the liquid gold when it's all done. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with these two gentlemen and show you what it takes to extract honey from beehives. Before we open them up, we smoke them. This just helps cover up the alarm pheromone. You know, bees like this sting, but these bees are pretty nice, so we'll see how they are today, though. Yeah, we got good bees here. Yeah, real nice bees. Very patient. We'll get the smoker going. Make sure it's not too hot. All right, let's give them a little bit. So they start doing a little their activity changes from the smoke. See them respond to it. This helps just cover up all the alarm pheromone. There's some bees in there. Okay. What is that? That's, that's, a, that's the, a queen. Yeah. What the heck? That's a queen. Where'd you find that? Right here on the rock. It wasn't on the, the, the roof, was it? This was the one that was on the roof, yeah. What the but heck? I don't know where she came from. You're gonna put it. I mean, is oh that dear. Her? Yeah, this is quite a weird. What is she doing outside the hive? I don't know. This is a strange turn of events indeed. I'm guessing it's that new queen we're trying to raise in there. Over and she, there. No, I think it's the other one. So she's, she, she was maybe over there? Maybe she was coming back from mating. But what we're going to do to be safe, we're going to cage her. We'll figure it out in a minute. Wow, that's weird. Never seen that before, so... We're, we're raising a new queen over in the other hive. So I'm guessing that's her. She's just popping back over. She'll find her way, but we're going to make sure before we just pop her into a hive, because you want to make sure you put her in the right spot. So he's just grabbing a little cage. So we have special cages we keep queens in. Uh, so they can be kind of rough on a queen when they, they don't know. They're not used to her smells. So before we put her somewhere else, this is not a typical beekeeping thing. This is a very, very strange thing that we're going to have to figure out. And get her to go up in the cage. Good eye though, Ken. Yeah, I'm Good looking eye. at her going. That's a queen. Yeah, you know. We've been doing this for two years now, so. I'm not a master like Cal, but okay. maybe, maybe in about 10 years. Oh, it yeah. <laughs> sooner than that. <laughs> okay, so we're just gonna put a couple workers in there to feed her. Boop. Okay, so we'll close that up with some wax. You want me to put it at the top of that one? Uh, yeah, let's put her, put her somewhere in the shade if you can. That was an unexpected thing. <coughs> so one thing about beekeeping, they always, everything, always expect you, you, know, yeah, you can't, you don't even know what's going to happen. You never know. And the bees don't really, they don't read the books, so they don't always follow any of the rules either. They do their own thing. We know more or less what they're going to do, but. Okay. 
So there's lots of ways to get the bees off of the honeycomb. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways, but we're gonna do, we're just gonna brush them off because we don't have that many to do. If we had like 10 hives, then we'd do a different method. But this is fine. Okay. First thing I'm gonna do is actually drive bees down. So they'll, they'll go away from the smoke too, more or less. We'll get some of them, drive them down into the hive. Okay. Pull this up. So that's, this side you can see it's got mostly capped honey. This side, it's still, some of it's capped, some of it's not. This is capped, that's uncapped. So what that tells us is they're still processing it. So the bees, they use their enzymes, but they also, they dehydrate the water out of the nectar and turn it into honey. So it's important not to get too much of this into the mix because you, you want your honey content to be very low in water. So we're actually gonna not take this one. And we'll take ones that are capped and let them finish capping it. So we'll just set this here for now. And you'll see, you know, these bees, they're not, they're not bloodthirsty. We have their hive open, they're pretty chill. That one's got a lot of capped honey. So we'll take this one. Okay, so we're gonna get them off. They're shaking. This doesn't hurt them. As you can see, they don't really care. Brush the rest of them. Gently brush them. They're eating some nectar right now. So some of them respond to the smoke by gorging themselves on honey, getting prepared if they have to leave. Because they think the hive's on fire. Yep. That's why, that's why they do what they do. And you know, humans a long time ago figured out to use the, use the smoke, because going into a beehive without smoke, they get really upset, and we don't like that. And while the smoke is hitting them, they just feel like they have more to worry about than us going into the hive because they're thinking a fire's coming. I'll take that. Get those off. Okay, there you go. Let's drop it in. Does it doesn't matter which way. Yeah, you put the, the put it in like you normally do. There you go. Yep. Good, good. And we're just doing that to keep the bees off it because they smell it and they will find it. See, that's completely capped. That's very heavy, about six pounds of honey in this frame. So that's, that's nice. Get them off. So as you can see, this is a slow method. A fast method is this thing called a fume board. It's got smells they don't like. You put it on the top, it drives them all down. But you know, we're only doing one hive, so it's might as well try to enjoy it, have fun with it. Another completely full. It's beautiful, that's what we want. Yeah, that one has a big patch yep. that they're still working we'll on, so we'll leave that. And now that there's room, I'm gonna put this one back in. So, you know, some people think, oh, you're taking honey from the bees, that's not good, but we're gonna leave them plenty. And it's kind of like they're paying rent in a way. We take good care of them, and they give us some honey. But we leave them plenty of honey. Because they eat it all winter long. Yep. That's what they use to stay alive.
I'll probably hit them with some smoke again. Yeah. Just to, to get an irritated. Yeah, you can hear it, them buzzing a little bit more. Yep. So you have to give them a little bit more smoke. And they're tolerating quite a bit. I've met bees that would never let you do this. So these are really, I've always thought these are very nice bees. What you want in an area like this where people are going to be. Okay, so this one still has a, has a patch. They're still, they're still bringing in nectar right now from goldenrod and aster, so still have some open stuff in there. We're gonna let them keep working with that. Yeah, that's a nice one. I'll take that. Yeah, we should get six frames because that's where it'll hold. Okay. And then we'll move right to that and we'll show them the decap and then okay. put it in the spinner. Sounds good. So this queen in this hive is actually two years old now. And she's a champion. She's such a beautiful, lovely queen. So the hive, you notice it looks like these frames are all stuck together, and that's from propolis, which is a very interesting substance that the bees make from tree resins and plant resins, and it's very, very, um, it's very healthy for them, healthy for us too. That's that stuff right there, it's resiny looking stuff. So that's antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, so it's a really, it's a really, it's a super healing substance. And the bees just coat all the inside to help be really healthy. So a beehive is very, very clean. Very clean. They go outside to poop. They, you know, if they do something like sting a mouse or something, instead of, you know, instead of having this large animal rotting inside of it, they'll propolize it and turn it into a mummy. So it's not, so it's, it's, it's very clean. It's all very sanitary. And also with, with honey, you know, a lot of people notice there's less regulations as far as jarring it, selling it. And that's because honey is also antimicrobial, antibacterial. And for a long time, it was the best thing for wounds. And for a lot of people, you know, they still use it for wounds and burns. And that's six right there, huh? Yep. All right, so we have enough to extract now. Put it down very gently so we don't squish any bees. I'm just closing it up so they don't. Because when they smell that much honey, they're like, oh sweet. Way less work if we just steal this honey. But we still want them to have good airflow. The way we extract honey, well there's lots of ways, but the way we're doing it today is we're taking the wax off the cells to get the honey out and we're using an extractor which is going to use centrifugal force to force the honey out and then the bees can reuse the comb later and it just helps them save energy so they don't have to keep rebuilding their comb. I don't typically use this tool, I usually use a bread knife, but this is a little, it's a little bit better. <laughs> Honey is very, very messy. It's one of the things about beekeeping, people learn fast. So you make a mess, you gotta look kind of like making a mess. It's real sticky. I'm gonna put this into the extractor. We got a bee checking out stuff. Yeah, yeah I just seen him, he's yeah. over there. Yeah. He said, what's, what's going on over here that's stealing my honey? Yeah. So, a bee, gotta get it back. bee sense of smell is unreal. 
and it's down to the parts per trillion. So it's like we really can't even fathom what their world is like. Just what things they can smell. So they definitely can smell the honey. So I like to remind people too that, you know, it's like honey's a lot more than just food, it's medicine. And you know, you hear that anecdotally from a lot of people, but also they've done a lot of scientific studies on it to see all the mechanisms behind it. And it can, it can do a lot of stuff. You know, for people back in the ancient world, that's pretty much all they had, antiseptic stuff. The process might be a little bit less glamorous than people think too. It's a little Yeah, I mundane. thought that this was like the, the the worst part of the whole thing is like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is like a lot of work. Yeah. Beekeeper, I know, he always told me it's like punishment for doing a good job. You yeah. Know, you <laughs> yeah. To, gotta sit there yeah. and clean all this up. And, yeah. The more honey, you got the more work. Yeah. You got. Well, we don't consider the work, though. No. Yeah, that's fun. The other thing we get out of this too is all this wax cappings. We get to use the wax after for stuff. Make candles, you can do whatever. Okay, we got all six of them in there. So it should be pretty balanced. There's a dial here for speed. Hmm. So we'll start off nice and slow. Make sure it's balanced, right? That should run pretty good. And if it's not, it'll tell you real quick. <laughs> yeah. So it flings the honey up against the, the sides. And then it collects at the bottom. So that's in slow motion, right? And then you speed it up. See the honey coming out? There it is. Before we go max, let's go ahead and stop it for now. We'll flip them around, do it slow, and then flip them back around. That's really the best way. How is it? Just as good as the first batch. <laughs> nice. Oh, we got a bumblebee checking us out. Oh, it's a bumblebee? Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put him in the honey. <laughs> Alright, let's flip him back the other way now. We'll max it. Smells good. It's gonna take some time for all the honey on the walls. That's a run down to where this bigot is, so it takes it a little, you know, honey's really slow moving. Starting to move now though. You can hear it. Yeah, you can hear it. Once it fills the walls up, then it just yeah, slides yeah, down. Yeah. As you can see, it's coming out now. Yep. And it goes through two filters. And one thing that's cool is real, real honey doesn't go bad, like ever. They found honey in the um, Egyptian pharaohs, you know, thousands tombs of years old. Yeah, in the tombs, it's thousands of years old, it's still fine. As long as it's closed up, you can't leave it open because then it won't go bad because it absorbs moisture from the air. This is one way to get honey too. Like another thing I do is I make, I make comb honey. So with that, I don't extract it. I just cut it and put it in packaging. And that's kind of nice because you can eat the honeycomb. It's completely edible. 
And it's good to have a little bit of pollen in the mix. See, one's carrying the pollen, so their back legs, they have like hairs and stuff they pack the, pack the pollen on. See those little yellow things on their legs? Those are pollen baskets. So they're up, you see there's quite a good little pollen flow going on, they're grabbing it. And that's good. So pollen's are protein source. And then the nectar, which they turn into honey, it's carbohydrates. And it's strange that, uh, you know, the, plant, the flowers that produce it form and the bees, I guess on the fossil record, they kind of disappeared at the same time because they need each other to exist. So it's kind of one of those things which came first, but both there. So I don't typically do too much. I do, I mean, you can't keep bees and not do a lot of honey. But I do, I typically focus on like um, swarm removals, taking them out of people's houses. Um, you know, I raise queens, a queen rearing program. And I, you end up doing tons of honey anyways. But. So there's only one queen per hive. And um, you know, a lot of people have this idea that the queen is, you know, she's in charge. You know, because these are all her daughters that we're seeing here. There's only one mom for all these. So all these, all these bees are sisters. But the queen, in a lot of ways, is not a slave, but she's not necessarily, she's not calling all the shots. And if she isn't producing like they want her to, they'll, re they'll replace her. So they can make queens. As long as they have an egg that's fertilized, they'll make a queen. So the queen's kind of stuck just laying eggs all the time for them and doing what they want. The workers really are in charge. And it's a strange group dynamic that they have. Because, you know, how do they make decisions as a group? They do. And they're very efficient at it, too. And it's just one of those mysteries of nature. And there is a lot of stuff we really don't know much about. How does the queen know where to fly to find the, the cloud of drones up in the sky, hundreds of feet, whatever direction? And they have, uh, you know, they, they have in their body, they can actually detect magnetism from the Earth. So people think they use that. There's a lot of speculating. Okay, we're just gonna go right down the brood nest where the action is. Okay, so they tend to put their honey up top. So why, I mean, one thing people don't realize about honeybees is why they even store so much honey? Like, what's the point of that? And it's because they're the only insect really that they overwinter as a collective. And since they're a cold-blooded creature, but collectively they're warm-blooded and they maintain a temperature. And so they need a lot of carbohydrates to do that. So they just put away as much honey as they can and they put away plenty and then we take a little extra. So we're just gonna open this frame, pull this frame out. But all winter long, when it's too cold to go outside, there's no, no flowers, no plants, you'll see them inside and they snuggle. They form a cluster and they keep warm and they eat their honey. But they put the honey up top, more or less, so that while they're moving up, they have food. And they, they end up at the top of the hive in the spring. Okay, so this frame sh shows some stuff going on. Okay, I'm gonna get a different one though, so we can see even more. Okay, so this is a, uh, you know, in the fall, they don't lay as many. The queen is the only one that lays eggs. Not properly functioning hive. I'm trying to see if we can get an example of that here, and we do. You'll see they touch each other constantly. They're always bumping into each other, feeling. Because in the hive, it's dark. And you see right there, that's a waggle dance. She's showing her sisters, hey, I found some good nectar this way. And so her dance, see the way she's getting them all excited? She's drawing a circle, and then she draws a line through the circle. And she's actually using the sun as, as like a re position relative to the sun. So when the bees leave, they'll know which direction and how far to go to find the nectar source that she's excited about. And she gives them a little taste of the nectar source to get them into it. And you'll see it a lot. A lot of different bees doing their little waggle dance and getting other bees going for it. And that's how they communicate with each other. And that's how they can efficiently pollinate and gather gather nectar and pollen. But you'll see um, the white things down in the bottom. So that's larva. That's the baby bees. And just like a, a butterfly, 
you know, they have a larval stage, they spin a cocoon, and then instead of a butterfly, they come out as a bee, as a worker. In the summertime, and right now, you know, a worker bee lives about 40 days, and she, she will literally work herself to death, and her wings end up becoming tattered, and she just, she just works herself to death. In the winter, they'll last the whole winter, because they're just hanging out, eating honey, and staying warm, so. Yeah, they, they, it's, it's, it's crazy how short they live, and they're very selfless. Like you take a, a, fr a frame with the brood on it, the baby bees, pop it into any hive, they'll raise it as if it's their own. They have this maternal instinct. And it's strange for bugs, because people think, oh, a cold-blooded animal, but they, they love their babies. A bee's job is relative to their age. When they're first born, they start cleaning, the, cleaning up the hive. You know, they, they, they take care of, of home house duties. And so one of the jobs that they'll do earlier on is called being an undertaker, and that's pulling out a dead bee. But bees, like I was saying, they're selfless, so they actually can kind of sense when they're gonna die, and you'll see it, they'll fly off, so their, their sisters don't have to bother dragging their corpse out, which is kind of a nice thing. And I see it in wintertime when I go out to my apiary, and I stand there in the snow. Every so often, one will just fly out, and just fly off into the sunset, and that's that, you know? It, they're very selfless. And it's an interesting thing to watch because you see them just fly off. And here you can see more uh, so capped brood like we were talking about. This is all the capped brood, baby bees. And if you look, you might see one emerging. Sometimes you see them popping out. Not seeing any jumping out right now. But um, you see all the pollen. And you see there's different color pollen in there too. Some more orange, some more. Yellow, all different color pollen, hundreds of types. But right now they're pulling in that golden rod mainly. So one thing that can happen is uh, why that they would reject the queen is sometimes bees will do something called us usurpation where they'll show up and they'll try to take, take over the hive. They'll show up with a group of workers and then the workers will form little protection balls around the queen and they'll kind of fight it out. But if a queen's coming right in, that's not their queen. They can smell it and, and they don't allow it. They've been recorded to go up to six miles, but to, and that's in, a, that's in just like a radius. So it's thousands and thousands of acres, but typically three miles. But yeah, I really like raising queens. That's like, because uh, you know, it's like bees aren't doing as good. So I try to, you know, I rescue and breed the, the best bees I can. Lots of pollen on this. Yeah, it's a pretty weird thing to get into, but once you get into it, it just kind of takes over. So I have a observation hive up over my bed so I can look at them through glass. They come, in, they come through the window. Yeah, it takes over, it really does. Just uh, start reading every book you can and then <clears throat> just dive right into it. And you know, reach out to local beekeepers. People like me who do like concierge beekeeping, it you know, can help you. I give beekeeping lessons. But uh, just reading, the library's a great resource. Hundreds of books there for you, so that works. But yeah, just start reading. And then don't be scared to just, just dive into it, that's what I think. You don't need to spend a lot of money. You know, some people think, oh, I need thousands to start, and it's like, no. Oh. I, I build hives out of trash. Like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty like low key. I keep bees in logs, all sorts of stuff. Fish tanks, coolers. You see how the bees are following her and tending to her. They love this queen. I love this queen. I do too. She's beautiful. She gets good honey. Yeah. Yeah, it's right there, right? Yep. As you can see, extracting honey from the bees, it's a little detailed, but it's very interesting to know all the parts of the, like the hive and what those bees do. They are very self-sufficient. We need them more than they need us because they're, they know how to, to produce this liquid gold that we all love so much. 
and the other products like the popolin and the, um, even the uh, pollen that they bring back. Everything is edible. The wax used for candles, lip balm, everything. Everything in that beehive can be used. So what I would like to say to everyone here first, I want to show you, we're going to jar a couple of these things because what I would do is now after my husband has gotten all the mess and given me this lovely bucket, I would just take the bucket and it would be on my counter in, that, in the kitchen so I would do it there. So what I would actually do would be to unscrew this a little bit and I will now start jarring my honey. It just comes out just like that. Of course, it would be in my kitchen. It'd be a lot, a lot easier. But this is what you get. And of course, I have friends that's just waiting for it. My husband keeps telling me, uh, dear, or honey, <laughs> not to give it all away. And honey, since it's so pure and everything, now you can actually sell this as whipped honey, but this will all settle and it'll end up coming out like this. This is from my earlier batch. So see, it just clears itself right up. Honey will virtually last forever. All I do is like, if I'm gonna use this one now, they got these cute little lids. Just push it on and now my honey's sealed. I don't have to do the canning process. This is, um, I like that because it's very decorative. And they're nice for giving as gifts. Now I know you see my husband and uh, Kyle rake it, but this is also a heated knife. My husband doesn't like doing it because it makes a mess because as soon as you cut that wax, the heat, the, the honey starts like coming out. So this is just sealed. This is how we do it. It's not like canned. Like this is, a, I canned the sauce from fresh tomatoes. It is sealed. It's canned. This will last on my shelf for actually years as long as it, the seal don't pop. So that's what, we, that's an actual canning process which you do not have to do. Of course I got this little Winnie the Pooh. My daughter bought this from me. It's cute. That's nice for the counter. And there's all kinds of jars. You can do gifts, everything. So even if you don't think you want to get a beehive, you got to read about bees. They are so amazing. So with that said, you must tune in to another show because that liquid gold, I'm going to show you what we do. And I'm going to show you a few things that we're going to put on the family table. If you have any questions, I know there was a lot, you can email me, Kathy's Family Table at Gmail, and I'll answer your questions the best I can. And if I can't, I'll ask Kyle and I'll get you the answers. But wait till you see what I'm going to put on the family table.